My name is Maureen McGee. I live in Calgary, Alberta, in Canada. I'm 44 years old. I'm an interior designer. I'm a curious kind of person. I like to meet other people and I like to get to know them and I like to understand where they come from. I'd never really dreamed of going to the Arctic. I'm like most Canadians, I head south for my vacations. But I had read that uh, the Inuit up in the north end of Baffin Island still went out on major hunts in early June. They traveled by sled and they went to the edge of the ice floes. And I didn't believe they still did that. And I'd never known anybody that had gone and seen that. Um, this was Canada and I didn't know anything about it. So I decided to go and find out. As I was looking out the window of the plane, I was surprised by the mountainous areas and just how long it took to get to where we were going. Pond Inlet is at the very northernmost tip of Baffin Island and it's the most ancient Inuit settlement in North America. When I first saw a pond, I turned to the person next to me in the plane and said, is that a suburb? Which, you know, caused a great laugh, uh, but no, it wasn't. It was the whole tiny hamlet. There are no roads around it. There's maybe two miles of roads, but basically you either fly in or maybe for a few weeks you, you can get in by ship. It was a scary looking place in many respects. I stayed with a Inuit elderly couple called Pia and Matthew. They didn't speak any English whatsoever. We needed an interpreter. They made me feel very welcome. Much food as possible given on the plate, uh, most of it being caribou. Uh, caribou stew, caribou steaks, spaghetti and caribou, macaroni and cheese and caribou. There was many, many children roaming around. Uh, Pia was uh, either taking care of grandchildren or neighbors' children. But it was fascinating to be staying with people when you didn't speak their language. She don't like this house because it's too old. She moved there uh, last year. Last year? Mm. Her husband, Matthew, was pretty taciturn. He was not a happy man, I think. He was one of the Inuit whose livelihood had been taken away from him. What he really wanted to do was be out hunting. I came out of the house one day. I was going for a walk. When I went around the back of the house, Lapia and her girlfriend were sitting outside carving up a raw seal. And they had very traditional uh, instruments. I'd never seen them before. I didn't know. Again, I just didn't know they still did it. And uh, I would have liked to have tried it. But when the kids offered me a ride on the all-terrain vehicle, it was uh, sort of wild at first, but I realized later that as an only mode of transportation, throughout the winter I'd really rather have a car. But it, it gets you to where you want to go pretty fast. I was walking around town, we 
came upon some boys, all ages, everything from six years of age to look to be about 16 or 17 years age. And they were balancing on a log and, and just basically having a simple game trying to push each other off. They just welcome me in. Am I supposed to hit him? Am I supposed to touch him? Push? <laughs> Next. Why is this big one? Whoa! When I started to head out on the trip to the edge of the ice flow, I had a momentary flash of, what am I doing here? Who are these people and where am I going? As we were loading up the sled, one of the owners brought out this very old rifle and packed it in. I was very surprised. I said, do you expect to need that? Uh, yes, there might be some polar bears around and there might have cubs at this time of the year and uh, yeah, you better have it with you. I realized just what I was getting into. Just as the comet talker, the sled was starting to take off, there was a huge jolt and I was perched up on top of all the equipment and the tent and everything and I was so excited I just couldn't stop grinning. <laughs> it was one of those look up at the heavens and say, my gosh, I'm really here, I'm really doing this, I can't quite believe my luck. When I set out on this journey, it was to reach the flow edge. The flow edge is where the ice on the open ocean has stopped melting and you have reached water. This is where the uh, wildlife has started to gather. The walrus, the narwhale, the seal, um, the polar bear. This is where the Inuit want to come to get their supply of food. My gosh, I'm really doing this. I'm heading off into the wilderness for three days where I don't expect to see another soul. I was very excited. After we had been traveling for about an hour, Joassi, the guide, stopped the sled at a site on land where there was two graves from whalers back in the early part of the century. I think they must have been very well-liked people because their shipmates had gone to a lot of trouble to put up uh, crosses and, and hammer out tin plaques with their names and the dates on them. But it struck me that these were the real adventurers. These were the real brave people. I felt very badly for their families. Probably they had never found these graves, and yet I had. We got back into the sled, and we were traveling and traveling, very bumpy ride over the choppy ice. and. There was mountains on the left and there was mountains on the right. We were going out an inlet towards the open sea. We came around a, a corner and there was a small iceberg, but it seemed large to me. Do that. Hey, sure, if you're gonna go, I'll go. 
wherever you go. It was scary. There were portions of open water around it for some reason, and we had to pick very carefully about where we were going to go. But uh, I followed very closely the guide. When we got to the iceberg, there was um, a, almost a portal cut out um, and melted, so it formed a gateway to get through. So we were able to clamber up the inside of the iceberg and then when we got to the peak there was this long gentle slope down the other side and Joassi was very dignified as an Inuit and he walked down but I couldn't resist. One of the greatest adventures was going to the bathroom. You're traveling along and there, there's no restaurants, there's no gas stations to stop at. You try and put it off as long as possible, but then you come to the realization you're going to have to do it. You're going to have to say to the fellow you're with, I'm going to stop momentarily on the other side of the sled. Can you keep your eyes front on the first side of the sled? And Basically, you, you wait as long as you can before you face the issue, and then you move as fast as you can because it's cold. As we were traveling along, I was bumping my way on the Komatak and reveling in the scenery, and at one point, Joassi stopped. He came back, and he got the rifle. And he pointed to a very small dot on the horizon and said it was a seal and said he was going to shoot it. I hadn't expected this. I was having real mixed feelings at this point. I wanted the seal to get away. But also, I realized that this was natural. This is what they're supposed to be doing. When we got up to the seal hole and I looked down, there was a little bit of blood and I would rather the seal had been killed outright. I didn't like the thought that he'd gotten away unless it was a minor injury, but if he'd been badly injured, I didn't, I would have rather he'd been dead. It was about 8 o'clock at night, although it was so bright that you'd think it was 2 in the afternoon. And we started to pitch tent and get ready. With my usual lack of preparedness, I hadn't realized that I was going to actually be camping on the ice. And I wanted to check and see how deep that ice was, and it was only 2 feet. And I'd taken a look at some of the cracks that we had traveled over, and they were breaking up pretty rapidly. I had to fight down tiny moments of panic as I crawled into the sleeping bag that night. It 
was a long night that night in the tent because it never got dark. Um, it was as bright as four o'clock in the afternoon for the whole for the whole night. I slept with a black scarf around my eyes, trying to sleep. I didn't really sleep very much. The quietness is beyond belief. There, are, there is no noise whatsoever. It's a peacefulness that we're just not used to. After a couple of hours of traveling on the second morning, we reached a bird sanctuary. The sound sneaks up on you in the Arctic. So we went from nothing more but dead silence to this wild, wild cacophony of sound with thousands and thousands of birds. To listen to that for more than a few minutes could really drive you crazy. I don't think it's blood. No. I mean, they don't look like they're fighting. Look at red, red, red cock. These rugged cliffs were just covered with two kinds of birds. The kitty weights are like small gulls, they're white and gray. The murrah birds are mainly black and, and white. Why they had settled on those cliffs, I don't know. And only on those cliffs and none others around. traveling along, the cracks were getting wider in the ice. We got to a crack that was over 15 feet wide, and there was no way a skidoo was going to jump it, and there was no way a sled was going to get across it. Joassi managed to scramble uh, along the base of the mountains and get to a point where he could jump over a crack in the ice, and he landed on um, a floating piece of ice that was probably about 40 by 40 feet. You just have to trust that the person you're with knows what they're doing and you just have to follow instructions. Can you get that big pole for me? The big? That one? This one? Yeah. He wasn't a big fellow, you know, and I couldn't do anything but watch. It took him about an hour. He was pushing his little ice island, 40 feet by 40 feet, across against the current of the ocean to narrow the gap where we had to push the sled over. Tell me what to do. Ah! That's okay.
family, there was just the four of us. There was the skidoo, the sled, Joassi and I. Bobbing very gently on this island of ice and the current in about 10 minutes just carried us across to the other side. No more problems. <laughs> we have no more problems. I never thought that people still did that. I thought that everybody had it pretty easy up here. That easy. wasn't easy. <laughs> that wasn't easy. <laughs> about four hours of traveling and a few stops along the way we could see this dark line on the ice ahead of us and as we got closer and closer I realized that it was open water it was the open sea that was it that was the flow edge that was where we had come to to be Joassi and I This is where I had wanted to come. This was the edge. The next stop was somewhere in Greenland, I believe. The water was black. The sky was black with sunshine coming through. The ice was white. It was very exciting. I hadn't realized we were going to camp right there on the ice, 20 feet away from the edge. And as we were setting up the tent, we spotted three walruses, huge things, they must have weighed a ton each, playing in the waves just a few feet offshore. The next morning, Joassi and I were going to pack up camp and head back to Pond Inlet when I realized that I just had such a brief glimpse of this very exotic way of life. And they were going to continue it. And I was not a part of it, really. I, I felt very sad. But I was just going to have to go back. I didn't, I didn't belong there. 